Well, we've got one more minute until 11.50, but I think we'll get started. It looks like everybody's settled in here. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about techniques for managing your OpenStack cloud. Um, I want to actually take a quick poll of the room. How many of you guys are developers out there? I'm guessing a lot of you. Okay. Um, how many of you are, are management folks? Okay, good mix of, of both. So, of you developers, how many of you guys are really excited about, you know, digging in and racking and stacking gear and actually setting up OpenStack? Okay, that's a little bit surprising. I had the same response, and I'll show you in a minute what I mean by that. Um, exactly. Oh, what about operations? Can I get a show of hands of operations? Okay. Um, you guys are not going to like my talk. I'm sorry for that in advance. <laughs> so, just a little bit of background about myself um, and where you may know me from. I wrote a guest blog on the Right Scale, um, sorry, the Rackspace blog. That might happen a few times through this talk. Right Scale is who I work for. Rackspace is a partner of ours, and they sound very similar, and they both have RS in them, and that's a great acronym for them both. Um, I built a, an OpenStack private cloud in my garage. Um, so. I did want to geek out a little bit. I wanted to be an ops guy for a minute um, and put a couple of super micro boxes in my garage. It's actually just off to the left there from my screen and my circular saw is a 67 Cadillac Sedan DeVille that is in about a million pieces. So I like to tinker with stuff. Um, but for me, the real interesting piece of setting this up was not as much getting the gear, plugging it in, installing. OpenStack and making it work. Quite frankly, that was overhead for me. That was, uh, you know, a, a good experience. I got familiar with the innards of OpenStack, but it wasn't really what I was trying to focus on. So, what I'm going to try to convince you guys today is that the best kind of management for your OpenStack cloud is actually no management at all. Now, I can see a few people laughing and thinking, "What the hell is this guy thinking? Of course, you need to manage your OpenStack cloud. That's ridiculous." So what I'm going to focus on is actually two things. And it's kind of first the ops piece, right? Managing your cloud hardware and software, getting the thing stood up, making sure it's healthy, making sure that your users can use it. Um, and then the other half is managing your cloud-enabled applications. And I'm guessing for the rest of the developers out there that didn't raise their hand for the, the ops question of being able to set up OpenStack, that's what you're interested in, right? You want to be able to consume OpenStack. You want to be able to run your applications on it. You want to be able to have a dev and staging and QA and production environment that looks all the same, that's API accessible. That's what I'm going to be talking about today for the most part. So to intro that a little bit, the first thing that I want to talk about is the ops piece, right? This is what you have to do to set up OpenStack. Um, you, you have all the logistics of racking and stacking gear, making sure you have power, making sure you have network, making sure all of those things are there for you. Um, and you install and you configure OpenStack. Um, and as a developer myself, I really appreciate that process, right? It's a lot of this, a lot of command line stuff, a lot of API accessibility. You're making calls like this one or like this one. Or if, like me, you ran into trouble during your installation, I, this is obviously not a very useful query, but I spent a lot of time looking directly in the database, which is actually really cool, right? OpenStack doesn't have a lot of secrets. It's completely transparent. You can go splunking in the database, and you can rip out endpoints and kill images and do all sorts of really nasty stuff that you probably shouldn't do. The next step, though, after you've got that all up and running and you've got all your gear up and you've got your cloud running and you've got all of your endpoints set up and Keystone has Nova registered and Glance is registered with Keystone and you can get images and you can launch instances and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's sort of when the fun starts, right? Um, and uh, in this case, I actually did the Rackspace Alamo installation. It actually made it really easy for me because I didn't really want to know too much about how OpenStack worked. I didn't have a lot of time to actually put that together. Um, so, you know, you've got the Horizon dashboard, in this case, the Rackspace branded one. And that's really great for both admins and for users, right? Admins can go in there, they can set quotas, they can add new users with specific permissions, right? It starts to abstract you away from the API, from the command line tools, from those sorts of things that are, you know, the overhead to actually running this thing. So, again, as cool as that is, 
What I'm going to try to do today is to convince you that the best kind of management for your OpenStack cloud is absolutely no management at all. What do I mean by that? I know you guys think I'm insane. So what we really want to focus on is this, right? It's the application that you're running on OpenStack. That's what's important. That's the thing that you're building the cloud for. That's the thing that you're buying all that gear for, putting it in your data center. It's to run your application. And if you're doing it right, your application is actually set up to know that it's running in an environment where it can request additional resources through an API, that it can health check itself, that it knows that it's running in this place where it has all of the benefits that you want from a cloud-enabled application and from that environment. So what I'm going to do is spend a bit of time talking about how RightScale really does those pieces. So the first piece of that is something that we call a server template. So your application, you've got NoSQL databases, you have uh, relational databases, you've got your application tier, you've got um, you know, batch workers, you've got all these things that make up your application. What a server template is, is that DNA or that description of what that thing is. So for your database server, let's say, what we have is actually a base image that actually runs on a variety of clouds, um, OpenStack being one of them. We've run on uh, Rackspace Public Cloud, which is OpenStack based. You can run your own private cloud, and we've got an image for that that runs on KVM. And it's the same known image everywhere, right? And we start out with very, very little. Um, it's just CentOS or Ubuntu or, you know, pick the flavor of Linux that you like. It's just that OS. It's a specific patch level and it's an agent that we call right link. That's it, that's all that's in the image. Obviously, that's not a lot, right? That's what you can probably get by launching something in the Horizon dashboard and by creating your own images and putting up, the, up there. So the next step is to actually run these boot scripts that happen at startup. So what this means is for your database server, you've got this base sent to us image, then we have configuration management code that runs and installs the MySQL packages and sets your administrator password, possibly pulls your database schema from uh, recent backup, uh, does all the magic that you need to, to set this thing up. Um, there's also operational tasks that you can perform. So again, for a database server, uh, we have in our base server template for MySQL and we also support Microsoft SQL and Postgres and a few others. There's the ability to set up a master-slave relationship. So we've got a little operational script that you can click on in the dashboard and you can run and you can end up with those servers getting set up in that master-slave arrangement. And I'll talk about this a little bit more. I've actually got a demo which will hopefully consume the majority of, of the time here. I know they put me right before lunch, which was fantastic, so I won't keep you from that. Um, so the other piece, and this is maybe the more interesting one and, and where the concept of really managing your OpenStack installation in your um, OpenStack cloud really starts to fit into this conversation is that RightScale also gives you a bunch of tools for actually keeping track of what's happening with your application. Now, I don't mean you know, these sorts of monitoring metrics on your KVM hypervisor or on your Zen server hypervisor or on your Nova node. Those are all things that are, we're kind of just assuming those are taken care of, right? That's, that's an operations job, <laughs> right? We want to have this cloud up and running. We trust that Ops will keep it going, but our application running on top of it has certain needs. We know that if we're running you know, an API, a uh, bunch of workers for an API, we need to make sure that those workers you know, can handle the number of requests that are coming in. If they can't, we need to add more workers. Uh, we need to know that if a certain server, a certain virtual machine is running on a physical node that's having some sort of problem, there's network connectivity issues, there's a bad stick of RAM in it, something like that, hopefully Ops knows about that. But if not, we actually have visibility into that from the activity and the sort of symptoms that you're gonna see on the VM. RightScale can see that, and rather than submitting a ticket with Ops with IT and saying, you know, help, there's a problem with memory on this instance, you've got an API. 
You call an API, get a new instance. We use that server template to configure it to be another API worker, and you're good to go, right? You don't have to wait. You don't have to ask ops. You don't have to wait for new hardware. That's the purpose of the cloud, right? It's that agility. It's the ability to make those API calls and get resources as you need them. RightScale gives you the ability to, to look at what's actually happening with your app so that you can make those decisions because you got an email, or we can automate those decisions for you. So I'll show you this in the demo as well. Uh, and then I also mentioned the operational stuff, uh, being able to click on scripts that uh, will do those operational tasks and they're well defined. So I actually only have like two more slides after this one. Going a little bit quicker through this than I expected, but that's all right. I'm gonna go through and, and do a little bit of a demo of the, the right scale dashboard. Um, is that good for font size? We'll get a little bit bigger here. And let's do that as well, not that. There we go. Okay, so what you're looking at is the, the right scale dashboard. So what we're gonna focus on, right, is the idea of that application centricity. So if you look on the right hand side here, we've got up at the top a list of a bunch of applications that I have running. In this case, it's in a mix of uh, Rackspace public clouds uh, and an OpenStack private cloud that we're running at RightScale as well. Um, what I wanna do is focus on this PHP 3 tier application. I'm gonna click on it and hope that the conference Wi-Fi, <laughs> nobody tweet or anything while I'm doing this, okay? All right. Um, hope that the Wi-Fi is good for me. So this is what we're looking at. This is a PHP 3 tier application. Um, we've got up at the top the database server, right? And that's based on a server template. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. Um, we're running, in this case, software load balancers, HAProxy and um, Apache. Apache actually in front of HAProxy so we can do things like rewrites and all that really fun magic that HAProxy is not so great at. Um, we chose to do load balancers rather than maybe uh, software load balancers instead of maybe the um, you know, F5 load balancer that you've got in your data center or if you're using a public cloud, uh, something like cloud load balancers with Rackspace or something else because this gives you the portability to run exactly the same thing anywhere. So maybe in my data center, in my private cloud, I do have an F5 in the rack and I can use that for load balancing and that's awesome. <laughs> But if all of a sudden I have a problem in my data center or I wanna run the same application in your data center in a regional office, something like that, maybe you couldn't afford an F5 for that regional office. So by using a software load balancer, it gives you the opportunity to run the same thing on commodity hardware with your cloud, right? Um, we focus a lot of, uh, on that sort of thing at right scale, being able to run the same sort of stuff everywhere. There's certainly more performant ways to do it. If you have an F5, use it, it's kick ass. Um, but if you don't, or you think that you're gonna need to move your application around, this is the, the better way to go. Um, and then down at the bottom, um, I've talked about the load balancer, talked about the database server. We've got two running PHP app servers. So this is a simple three tier. Um, you know, uh, it's running, you know, let's call it maybe WordPress or Drupal or whatever you like, right? What I want to do is take a moment and actually take a, a look at the server template real quick and show you kind of the guts of that. Actually, I retract that. What I want to show you <laughs> is that the configuration management that we have on each one of the server templates um, is used to actually configure each one of these things, right? So load balancers end up installing HA proxy, install Apache, do all of that magic. Um, but they're, for the most part, general purpose. I told you that we are using a PHP application server server template. Well, what if I don't just want to run generic PHP or I want to maybe run Zend or I want to uh, change my you know, memory limit settings or whatever the case may be? The way that you're able to do that is actually with inputs in the right scale dashboard. So we make these fairly general purpose and you can actually tweak a lot of the settings uh, by actually changing inputs. And probably the, the most interesting one here uh, is gonna be the repository that we use, which apparently I actually set at the array rather than the deployment level. But imagine that um, where it says 
the repository uh, container, uh, the second one up that's in white. I can put in my git URL there or my subversion URL, wherever my source code for my application is, I can set the branch for it. And when I put a new server into this deployment, that's a PHP application server, it's going to inherit those settings. So when it comes up, a script's going to run that goes and clones that from Git, checks out a specific branch, and it's up and running. So I'll show you a little bit more about specifically the app server here, because I think that's really the interesting bit. Because we put all of these things in the frame of a deployment of your application inside of this thing, uh, we're able to do some really cool things in terms of having your application and the actual nodes of that application be aware of one another. So this is the server template for the PHP app server. And, and this is sort of what it looks like in terms of the scripts that it runs and the operational tasks that you can perform on it. The font's kind of small, but uh, you know, the first several steps are all housekeeping stuff. We set up a swap drive, we set up logging, we set up uh, some right scale tools that we're going to use. We make sure that uh, our repositories are set up. We make sure Apache's installed, all of these things that are, you know, expected for a PHP app server. And then we start doing things that are really specific to the PHP app server, right? This is that do update code. Those inputs that I showed you where you specify your repository, this script runs, grabs that input, goes ahead and downloads your code, makes sure that it's set up and does all that magic. And then the really interesting part um, is that we go ahead and we find load balancers that are in the same deployment. So I mentioned that we're running uh, HA proxy based load balancers, software load balancers. This script uses RightScale, makes a call out to our API um, and says, hey, I, I want a list of all of the load balancers that are in my deployment. I'm an application server. I need load balance traffic to come to me. When it does that, it actually, this particular script actually uh, opens up an IP tables firewall rule so that those load balancers can actually send traffic on port 8000 down to the app servers, right? Um, we do that because we are a multi-cloud company um, and not every cloud that we support has the concept of security groups, has the concept of the things that are starting to really uh, take off in quantum of being able to do that network isolation and so forth. So we kind of automate that as well. If you don't have any way to isolate your network, we'll automate IP tables, firewall rules on each node so that you have that sort of separation. The next thing it does, uh, or the next to last thing it does, um, is it does another routine very similar to that. It goes and identifies all the load balancers. And then even cooler, it says, hey, load balancers, go ahead and run the script on yourself that adds me, a PHP server, PHP application server, to this particular load balance pool. And oh, by the way, this is my dynamically assigned private IP address. So it all happens basically, well, completely automatically without any user intervention. So you get a new application server, it's registered with your load balancers, it knows about the database server, it's up and running, it's ready to go. So let me take you back to, how am I doing on time? All right, let me take you back to the deployment. And I wanna show you just one more bit um, and then we'll open it up for questions and then uh, I'll get you guys off to lunch with plenty of time. So I talked about how we monitor, and I, I just kind of clicked down into the load balancer that's running in this particular uh, deployment for this particular application. So this is what our monitoring looks like. Um, on the back end, it's actually pretty simple. We use a, a daemon called CollectD. It's an open source thing, just like OpenStack. So that's a great, uh, great deal there. Um, it's been around for a long time, and there's a lot of pre-existing plugins for it. Uh, out of the box, we you know monitor things you would expect like CPU and memory and disk use and network I/O and all those sorts of things. Um, but on this one, because it's a load balancer, we've also installed the Apache plugin, so we can do things like look at Apache requests per second. There's no traffic on this. Um, we can look at making sure that the HA proxy process is running. We can check to see, let's see, all sorts of interesting things like sessions disabled for HA proxy. And you can also customize any of these and create your own. So if you write your own application and you want to know about daily active users or you want to know about 
um, the number of times that uh, users open a particular container in your game, right? You can expose those things and monitor them and put them in the right scale dashboard, right? And then you can use any one of those monitoring metrics to do the automation, right? So this is all of the alerts, we call them, that are tied to this particular load balancer. Um, and you can see in this column, these are all actually defined by the server template. So these are common things we know that a load balancer is going to need. We know it's supposed to be running Apache, so we make sure it's running Apache. And if it's not, we do something about it. Um, you can also add your own here. Um, we could actually add one for um, Apache request per second. And if it reaches a certain threshold, we can do something about that. We can launch another load balancer and register it with DNS. We can decide that that means that we need more application servers. We can decide that it means that we need to flush the cache on our database server so it performs better, or not flush the cache. That would have the opposite effect. But the point is you can make those sorts of intelligent decisions based on the monitoring information, right? So um, the, the things that you can actually do from here is, is obviously sending an email. I've talked about that a few times. Um, you can um, run a script on the server that has the problem or on any other server that's in the same deployment. Um, and then this is also how we drive auto scaling. So we can automatically decide on, based on certain thresholds to add or remove servers from a deployment. So I'll stop for a, a second and ask if there's any questions because I don't have a, a lot more prepared. Yes? Yep, good question. So the question is when I, when I say by servers, do I mean uh, virtual machines or the physical nodes that are, are running the hypervisor site? I, unfortunately, the terms end up being very interchangeable. Um, specifically, in this case, I'm referring to virtual machines. So this is all a very virtual machine focused, um, application focused view. Uh, so quite frankly, we don't care that much about the physical nodes. Um, that's that's ops job. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's application management. It's not OpenStack management. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe I maybe I chose the wrong point to drive home. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, and so the the question from the audience is why is why is this not management? It is. It's management at a specific layer. It's a management at the application layer. Um, the reason that I really was focusing on you know, the best management for your OpenStack cloud is no management at all, is no management at all, is that from a developer perspective, you expect the cloud to be there. You expect the cloud to be managed. You expect it to be up. You expect it to be working. What you're interested in, in most cases, is managing your application, managing your workload running on top of it. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So the question um, is, can you build different environments with for dev, QA, production, et cetera, um, and have different properties for those? So that's actually precisely what we do, right? Um, so that concept of the server template and the deployment, a deployment, you can have an identical deployment for production, for dev, for staging, and they all use the same configuration management, the same base image, uh, all of the same components to create that. So if I click on my PHP 3 tier here, which is loading and may take forever, um, there's actually a clone button up at the top. So I can take this, say this is my prod environment, and I'm a developer that needs to test an issue that is occurring. Uh, I'll get to your question in just a second. Make sure to raise your hand again so I can pick you out. Um, and you need to test a, an issue that's happening in production. You can clone this whole environment. And it's going to take with it all of those inputs that you set at the deployment level 
everything, right? This is exactly production. And if you launch the database server and run that operational script, it's going to pull in the latest uh, backup from your production database, and you can actually operate on that if you wanted to, right? So you have the bit of flexibility to set up that same thing. There's no more, well, I'm going to promote my code to production, but my dev environment and my QA environment was a little bit different than, it's production. It is exactly the same configuration. Let me take another question, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so there's there's ways to mitigate that. Um, the question is, have we considered the the, the risk of denial of service attacks? Um, so there are four arrays specifically, which is the part that we usually auto scale and that we add additional nodes to. Um, you can actually set a, a minimum and maximum, right? So. At minimum, I know that I need two servers all the time. At maximum, I don't ever want to run more than 100 because my app doesn't scale that far, or that's probably a problem, <laughs> right? Um, so there's controls for that as well. The other thing that you get is that you can set up alerts for all of these things. So if you've got a bunch of servers that are, are a bunch of instances, virtual machines that are coming up, um, as a result of something, a denial service attack, or maybe better, a success disaster, um, you have visibility into that. And you can start getting emails and you can go look at it and go, is this a problem? Is someone trying to, you know, DDoS me? Or is someone, you know, did marketing do a really good job in driving a bunch of traffic to my side? There's a question in the back, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question, I'm going to reiterate it just to make sure I understand it, um, is if we have a, a way to uh, install that agent on Linux operating systems and, and kind of give you the same monitoring tools, even if it's not necessarily launched from OpenStack or a cloud, is that the question? Yeah, and to take advantage of the meeting, uh, management systems for customers to measure, you know, the Right, so for, for also for monitoring the billing pieces as well, yeah. Uh, so, so the short answer is today, no, uh, we don't. Um, we actually make the, the assumption that instances that we manage are ones that we've provisioned through an API, and that usually means through CloudStack, OpenStack, a public cloud, something like that. Um, we're definitely looking at ways that we can provide that sort of functionality and feature set. Um, because there are a lot of folks that are asking for it, people that have a mixed environment of legacy and, and bare metal and hardware that they really kind of want to have some of these tools for. So we're exploring it. Um, we don't really have great answers for it just yet. Any other questions? Yes? Um, so the question is, the, the scripts that I showed you, are those out-of-the-box scripts, or um, also can you customize them, et cetera? Um, so the ones that I showed you are actually pre-built server templates that we have in our marketplace today. So when I set up my OpenStack cloud in my garage, once I got the configuration and hardware and everything else figured out, I registered that OpenStack cloud with RightScale, and I imported those server templates, and I ran that same PHP 3 tier that you saw on my own cloud in like about an hour, right? So there are pre-built stuff that you can import. You can also, the same as I cloned that deployment, and it kept all the configuration of the deployment, and then I could change things if I wanted to. You can do the same with server templates. So I can take that whole server template, that definition of a PHP application server, clone it, and then make changes to it. You know, maybe I don't want to, <coughs> excuse me, maybe I don't want to, you know, install certain components, so I take those out. Maybe I have a specific proprietary third-party binary that I need to install. I can write a script that does that. Um, and the scripting language is uh, basically any executable that um, the underlying operating system can understand. So it's Bash, Perl, Python, Ruby, whatever, right? Um, and then we also have a really tight integration with Chef as well. I saw another hand over here. To, yeah. Um, uh, the, the about the 
Yeah, so um, the question is about the alerting metrics. Um, the expression language kind of looked like it was, you know, if value is equal to less than, greater than, et cetera. Um, the question is how flexible is that? Um, right now it's a, a per metric decision, right? So you can't say if this metric and this metric meet these criteria, then do this. Um, for the most part, that works just fine. Um, especially as it pertains to health checking and making sure that you have sufficient capacity for an application. So we've had good success with that. Um, there are certainly scenarios where you would want a little bit more intelligent decision making. Um, and in that case, uh, the answer really is our API. Um, we expose all that monitoring data and all that alert data through our API. Um, and you can actually use that to, to make a slightly more informed decision and then call our API again to you know, affect change on your applications. Um, we're actually working on some really cool things around that as well uh, that I can talk to you about after the session if you're interested. Any other questions? They cut my slides off. I do have a QR code for you to scan if you're interested. but. Um, That's it. All right. Thanks, everyone.